What is up? What is shaking? <laughs> Potato chips or bacon? My name is Adam Jacoby of GoIowaAwesome.com, and I am joined by Tom Close, also of GoIowaAwesome.com. And this is the Iowa Sports Review, the first of 2022. That sounded yeah. like I rhymed on purpose, and I did. I, I, that <laughs> just totally happened. You had that scripted. I know you did. Totally, totally. <laughs> um, this is our post-game edition of the Citrus Bowl, and it was not a merry citrus, unfortunately. Uh, 20 to 17 is your final score. Kentucky with the game winning touchdown drive, uh, culminating with under two minutes to go. And that was the downfall. Iowa could not rally in the final couple minutes. And uh, boy, I'm sure you guys have got a lot to say about quarterbacks. I'm sure <laughs> you do. And right off the bat, Hayden, good to see you as always, friend. Same <laughs> Petrus, different game. This, I'm I'm actually going to disagree with this take. Because if, if Spencer Petrus was throwing three interceptions a game, he would not have made it to the Citrus Bowl, right? Yep. Like, yep. he is, you know, he's, he's always been the, uh, the game manager, so to speak. And, uh, and he, he did not manage this one. Uh, and it's too bad because he did make some good throws. Like I thought, and, and Tom, correct me if I'm wrong, but there were times where Spencer looked, dare I say, adequate, capable, yeah. capable, almost competent at times. Well, heck, I mean, on that last drive, mm -hmm. I, I think it was the last drive, he threw into double co coverage sort of along the sidelines and hit Laporta, who was spectacular today. Oh, yeah. Um, right, you know, where the old cliche where only he could catch it. I mean – and I think that's the thing with Petrus that's maddening because there will be flashes. I always think back to whenever he's struggling, I always think back to that Iowa State game when he made the throw to Charlie Jones. And it was such a great throw. And it's like – or the Reganey play against Penn State. And you can see it, you know, but it, it, there's just not enough of that. I mean, they ran the same play with the Reganey play, and he missed them by a mile uh, yeah, earlier in the game. That was bad. That yeah. Was bad. Yeah. So, I mean, with Petrus – I think the bad just outweighs the good. And I think that's the ultimate problem in terms of the throws and stuff. But when he's on, yeah, he looks, he looks pretty good. As good as a game manager can look. Um, yeah. You're right yeah. about the turnovers though. If he's throwing three interceptions a game, he's not, he's, he's gone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, I, I think it, it's easy to say, well, you know, he's, he's not a very, capable quarterback and and so anytime that you know a pass doesn't go right yeah um you know it, it automatically turns into a referendum on whether or not he should be starting or on the roster or, you know a scholarship player at all like yankees you know uh and and that is that's a bad situation to have your quarterback be in i i don't know what yeah. 2022 is going to hold for these for that QB room. I really don't. I, I could be convinced of so many different uh, scenarios. Yeah. Now, yeah, I, I you know, we, we were just talking right before we went on and, and everyone just screams, Joey Labus, Joey Labus, Joey Labus. <laughs> like we've seen him win God. games before yeah. play Big Ten competition. So I, I think that's really the big unknown. I'm also wondering where uh, Alex Padilla is after this game because mm -hmm. I I was a little surprised they didn't flash to him at least in the second half or something like work him in. Um, and so it, I, I don't think it's, I, I, it, it feels like Kirk knows the room and is reading the room and knows that it's a competition in the spring. I may be way off. I just, Could it's be. just kind of like, if it's not a competition, I'm starting to question Kirk's, you know, maybe it's a competition and Spencer's the best guy, but I would really start to question the, you know, football acumen of some of these guys that have been doing this professionally way more than I, I've, I've never done it. You know, it's yeah. just so I think there will be a competition at the very least, um, you know, but is it just Joey Labus, Spencer Petrus, and that's it? Um, do they hit the portal? Is there anyone in the portal? I don't know. And that's the big question, obviously. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I wonder about the transfer situation because, you know, the, the old maxim is if you've got three quarterbacks, you've got none. And it, it sort of feels like Iowa's got three quarterbacks right now. Yeah. But um, 
But again, like I could see Kirk Ferentz putting his eggs in any one of those three guys' baskets. He is going to have to do something yeah. uh, along those lines, though, because this is not a situation that uh, is going to be able to carry over into 2022. First of all, the players themselves are not going to sign up for this again. Um, yeah. I will be shocked if nobody transfers. I'll be shocked. Um, I, I would be more shocked if zero players transfer or zero quarterbacks transfer than if two of them do. Right. I, right. I, I don't think, I don't think two will outside of do so again. Right. <laughs> yeah. so, so we're already a one. And yeah. so we, I, I think we are going to get to that number two. Um, but yeah, they, they, they got to figure something out. And I, it's my recollection and in, in mind, mind you, I haven't done the research to back this one up, but it's my recollection that when the whole Rudock and Beathard thing was happening, uh, I think Rudock played the entire bowl game before Kirk Farron said, yeah, we're going with Beathard. Like, like this might've been Petrus's opportunity to yeah. win the job for 2022 and he might've flunked it. That was the Hawk Slayer Bowl, right? The Tech Slayer Bowl. Yeah. God, I uh, just black that out of my mind. But I want to say, and I want to say at the at the le very least, uh, Bethard came in like at the end. But I can't. You're right. He. I mean, yeah. it was Rudock's job. Mm -hmm. at, clearly. Um. So yeah, I. I <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, I, you, you mentioned the transfers. I think Padilla just feeling this out. It just feels like it's never going to be his time, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying it should be. It just, you know, he had the job. They gave it back to Petrus. He came in after the Big Ten title game was gone, uh, you know, and didn't even play today after a really bad first half, I thought, from Petrus. So I, I, it's, I, it would be a slam dunk. I don't know with Petrus. I don't know if that's a spring thing. He graduated, so I, it could easily happen. Um, I don't think, and I, th I think those are the two candidates. I'm not sure, Yeah, you know, Labus is going anywhere. I think he's a true freshman, and then they have other guys coming in. So mm -hmm. I, Carson it, May. Yeah, and yeah, I, I've heard May, good yeah. things about yeah. uh, May, too. Yeah, well, he's, he'll be the new, you know, we'll be hearing his name next year. <laughs> he, he's going to be the, the new game. BMOC. Right, yeah. right. The, yeah. yeah. Best, best thing you can be in an Iowa offense is a third-string quarterback. Uh, Nefarious, we're actually going to get to your question now. Is punting on fourth and mm. inches with Linderbaum out? Boy, that's a tough one. You know, <laughs> I when it, when it was happening, I was texting with a buddy, and, and he said, you know, I would go for this. And I said, I would too. But that's not the way that Kirk operates. It's never been the way that Kirk operates. And, you know, like he has always given credit for this. But Kirk Ferentz has always still believed that punting is winning. Yeah. He's never he's never shied off from that. And you know, it took Taylor punting it into the end zone, right? The the coverage didn't get there in time and and it wasn't a good kick. It took Wandale Robinson going absolutely thermonuclear. And and the one thing that the Iowa script has always said, you know, was make them make the mistake or, you know, make them make the play to win it. And most of the time the, um, the opponent doesn't do that, but Kentucky yeah. did. And boy, it was a heck of a drive for them. Um, and what a play by Robinson. Yeah, it, it was, it was. Yeah. And, and it also sort of feels like they went to the well one too many times in terms of asking the defense to make a stop. Like those were the first points the defense had given up in the entire second half. Yeah, they played their butts off, and and it's too bad that they didn't get more points to to fall back on. Yeah, you know, I am I guess in the minority just reading the room and Twitter, which is a mistake. But always. I always, yeah, I shouldn't get off that. But <laughs> I actually, first of all, we all knew, everyone knew, Mike uh, was it Mark Stoops, Mike Stoops, he knew. I was going to come out, try and drum off sides. Now I think the timeout was inexcusable. Like you can't, if you could just take the penalty, you have Tory mm -hmm. Taylor who punted it in the end zone, take the penalty and punt it. That was inexcusable to me. Then, then really not going for it because I, this is what they've done all year. This is the same guy, Kirk Ferentz. He took three knees 
at midfield at home and then punted against Penn State. Yeah. In like, yeah. you know, you know, the same situation. Dare, and so, dared him to, to score the touchdown. Yeah. Yeah. He remember, and, he, and they I think they were they were kneeling it against Minnesota at the end to go up by more than a field goal. So I I can't kill him for it because they've won 10 games using this philosophy. And Bingo. quite frankly, I trusted the defense more than them getting that yard. They had been stuffed. They had the botched sneak, which really ended up costing them the game, it turned out, earlier. Yeah. And they were stuffed on a third and one when they should have just sneaked it. That was a bad call when Linderbaum got hurt. Yeah. And they couldn't, they could not get a yard. And and if anything, I would go back to the third down and whatever it was, two, where it, there's almost four minutes left. I think there was three and a half left. You're not gonna even a first down wouldn't have ended the game. It would have gotten, you know, it probably Kentucky would have been in a bad spot. It, it would have changed the, the dynamics. It would have changed the dynamics. It would have, yeah, but it, yeah. but it wasn't going to end the game. And so right. with Kentucky with a timeout on that third down, I would have looked into throwing the ball or running a boot, Ooh. you know, throw to yeah. throw to a Laporta like a short pass, something because we all knew it was going to be a handoff. We all knew that. Oh yeah. So oh, yeah. I, I can't kill him on it. It's been all year with this. You know, it's game fourteen. This is what they do. The defense was so good in the second half, and you're right. But as equally, they went to the well too many times. I mean, it, it ended up that was the game. It burned them. But if he goes for it on fourth down and they get stuffed, we're saying trust your defense. They've been so good. You know, yeah. so I can't. My biggest thing with this game, they took the first half off. The defense was mm-hmm. spectacular to hold Kentucky short fields. The offense did absolutely nothing, and you can't win games like that. Yeah, yeah, the – I mean, you don't ever want to give a, a an opponent like Kentucky a 10-point lead. Yeah. Right? And Iowa was capable, and they did. Like, they were capable of coming back. They actually scored two offensive touchdowns. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were but, shocking. It's like yeah. shocking when they scored touchdowns. <laughs> and, like, they were really good-looking plays, too. You're like, yeah. whoa, whoa, whoa. It's, it's like <laughs> watching a five-year-old do a backflip. It's like, what? where did this come from? So true. Um, but, you know, scoring those two touchdowns, which, you know, is as big of a thing as it was, uh, all it did was give them a four-point lead, right? Because yeah. they, like you said, they took that first half off, um, really did not take advantage of opportunities. Uh, yeah, they were, they spent so much time behind the eight ball. Uh, yeah. And it, it's too bad. It's too bad. And and hopefully, um, I I know that there is a lot of pressure on that coaching room in Iowa City to do something, anything about the offense. Because even the beat writers, <laughs> you know, the the boot lickingest of them all, um, <laughs> even they are starting to ask questions because there's you know there there's there's been some quotes that get. More or less taken, I don't want to say taken out of context, but uh, I will say uh, interpreted in the least flattering way possible. But the quotes about how Labus still needs to learn the offense and he might be a year away on that. And everyone's like, what is there to learn? This is stupid. Everything is stupid. <laughs> Quarterback shouldn't need to learn anything. And that's that's not the right message to take from that. But it, yeah. but. I think you do have to start asking, and Chad Lysakow did ask uh, Brian Ferentz, like, hey, look, this this offense is not performing. And, and so if you're, like, are you putting too much on the quarterbacks? And uh, and I will say, I'll say this too. Um, Lysakow couldn't come out and say it, but it was pretty clear that Brian Ferentz was giving some very evasive answers on that mm. front. And and some of it is you don't want to go talking about your entire philosophy and, you know, what your strategic objectives are to the press. Like I get that some of that is like inside only knowledge, but you know, when, when you're asking the offensive coordinator about, you know, what the offense is supposed to be, you know, doing. <laughs> it's it's like the two bobs in office space. Like, like Chad, Chad was nice about it, but he was basically saying, what is it you say you do here? <laughs> and, and Brian's answer was something to the effect of, you know, well, Iowa's uh, identity is that we try to win in all three phases of the game, offense, defense, special teams. And so, you know, yeah. we won't always, and which is not an answer. 
it's not an answer. Yeah. Um, it, it read a whole lot more like somebody who's like, well, what would a head coach say? Cause I want to be head coach one day. And like, that's not his role right now. Um, it's just not, uh, Nicholas, good to see you, friend. Um, both lines dominated today. Awesome to see the D line live in Kentucky's backfield. Oh, they were yes, great. the uh, defensive line played great. Offensive mm-hmm. line had their game of the year. Yeah, uh, easily, easily, Absolutely. easily. I, I you haven't know, seen Connor Colby look that good all season. He well, you know, you like mentioned a different dude. You yeah. mentioned that this could have been a like a, a Rudock audition type of game, and I think that's very fair. In that, you know, the one defense I guess I would have for Petrus all year and that's not very popular to defend him, is that there were games where he he takes two two steps and he's on the ground, you know, and he mm-hmm. can't move. And today was not the case. I mean, he had time all day. Mm-hmm. They were running the ball. Hell, even on the, on the, the, the interception he threw at the end, he kind of got hit, he, but it's still yeah. like he had a guy, you know, like he, he had was under time. Grass. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, I think this was more – it's funny because this was one of the – that second half he was making some of the best throws he's made all year, and it was still mm-hmm. one of the games probably most in, indicting of them all year just because the lines were great. I mean, the offensive line was wonderful, and I do wonder how much the Tyler Goodson skill set was screwing – not screw well, just maybe Iowa didn't know what to do. Like they were yeah. – both the Williamses just feel like more of those Iowa backs now. Mm-hmm. Um, and it yeah, was great this thing. Yeah. I, I, I think you're onto something here because it, it definitely feels like, especially after they were both more successful in 2020, it mm-hmm. definitely feels like Petrus and Goodson both were bad fits for what the offensive line was bringing to the table. Or you could also turn around and say, well, the offensive line wasn't a good fit for the quarterback and running back, which is also a bad thing to have. Right. Mm-hmm. We, Put it on either one of them as, as much as you want. Uh, Ethan, uh, I, <laughs> Tom, I was trying not to laugh during your comment uh, because of this comment from Ethan right here. So you're just kind of <laughs> <laughs> Ferenc Meandering Coach speaking, Matt Kim's mall kiosk motivational poster wisdom. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, so I think the real question is, was Iowa a together team in the Citrus Bowl? <laughs> um, but Ethan, I think you're right. I think like... They're, they're, Chad Lysakow was giving him so many opportunities yeah. to, you know, put some meat on those bones and he, he, he didn't want to do it for whatever reason. And, and I get that some of it is probably like, I'm sure this has been a super long season for Brian. And yeah. I, I'll also say this, um, he's been given opportunity after opportunity to bury his players and he hasn't yeah. taken that opportunity because I, I, I think it's absolutely valid that the, the execution has not been where Iowa's expectations are this season. And, you know, it's, it's one thing for us to notice that and, and to say it out loud, but whenever a coach says it, it really, you know, comes off the wrong way. And so he didn't do that, but, that also means that, okay, if, if you don't want to address the execution publicly, mm-hmm. um, and here we are talking about public executions, it's 2022. Um, <laughs> Brian Kelly. You, right, yeah. Um, <laughs> if, if you don't want to address that, okay, then all of that negativity for how bad this offense is, and it is objectively bad, all that has to come on Brian. Yeah. And so here you go. Like, <laughs> well, what does that mean? I mean, is he Teflon? <laughs> you, you know, you, you sort of have to wonder. Yeah. Um, you know, he's obviously he's not going to get fired. Yeah. Um, but it it really really seems like this is an opportunity for him to coach somewhere else, develop his own style, and you know, take a little bit of that nepotism like grime off of him. So when the time does come, he can say, Hey, look, I'm not just here because of my daddy. Yeah. You know, I I've I've got a resume to to show for it. And um I, I think Iowa fans would really appreciate that. I think he does. Um yeah, well, so, so, uh, wait, so you're insinuating him, him leaving Iowa? I that would, would I mean, not would I would great. not mind seeing it whatsoever. Well, no, I mean we wouldn't mind it. I guess I mean maybe that's his only chance of 
getting the head job ever. I think I think that is. I yeah. think that is. Uh, and we also don't know what the personnel recommendations uh, related to all of the um, ugliness of yeah uh, the the Doyle situation because obviously Doyle was let go. Mm. But they also said that they had made some personnel recommendations. Now there's there's no telling whether Iowa is going to you know care about what those recommendations are, whether they follow them or not, or even what they are. Yeah. But you know, a situation like that, where it was not clear that Brian was going to come out of that unscathed, it would not surprise me if one of their recommendations was this guy can't be number one on your lists of you mm-hmm. know head coach and waiting um and so i think he really needs an opportunity to distance himself from that scandal too because he did not come out of that looking good and uh you know there's yeah. a whole lot of recruits with long memories and a whole yeah. lot of parents and coaches with long memories too and so you know i i think a fresh start for him is the best way for him to solidify a long-term presence in Iowa city, right? Like it's, it's totally uh, paradoxical, but the best, if he really wants to spend 20 years of his life in Iowa city, the best mm-hmm. thing he can do is go leave for a couple of years. Oh yeah. I no, honestly he, believe that. Yeah. If he stays and then Kirk just retires, he's not around. I don't, th- I mean, I don't think, oh, you gosh, know, let's, no. let's be real. I think oh, it's no. going to be Mark Stoops. Um, and he's you probably know, I'm just spitballing, but it feels like it. Cause he's yeah. every time, I think he probably quoted Hayden Fry in the, the victory celebration press mm-hmm. conference too. Um, but well, yeah, I, I right. would say, I would say the number one coach on Iowa's on Barta's little list and everyone's got a list. The number one coach, his last name is Stoops. I just don't know what his first name is. <laughs> Bob looked good. He, he still has. He still knows. He still knows what he's doing. And you know, like, and uh, he went out of his way to say, "Like, man, I miss that feeling." Yeah, like, oh, that I'm incredible. just saying. I, like, <laughs> it, it really feels like Bob is moving his chess pieces out in the open for everybody to see. It oh, really feels like that. Uh, yeah. And and obviously, Iowa's boosters would be over the moon about it, right? Yeah. Like, it, it's not a situation where the the brain trust in Iowa City would be like. No, we don't want any part of that. There, there's <laughs> nobody making any sort of decisions outside of the Ferentz family. There's nobody who would say, uh, easy on Bob Stoops. No, <laughs> no. And if there is, they should be whatever, thrown out of the booster club. Like, I, I, I would like to know their names. Yes, <laughs> we'll yes. put it that way. That's what I. Uh, Nicholas points out, uh, going, going back to the dreaded, uh, backup quarterback discussion mm. but uh, Padilla said it takes about a year and a half in the system to be comfortable with the playbook and and again like that sounds like a lot uh, especially for how um, not productive this offense is you're like a year and a half to learn what um, but yeah I, I think most quarterbacks at most schools would say something very similar about their playbooks too. You know, quarterbacks at more successful defenses or um, offenses. So like, I don't, I don't put a whole lot into the Iowa's offenses too intricate, right? Like I, I don't think this comes down to Petrus not knowing what a read ought to be. Mm-hmm. I do, but I could be wrong. Uh, but I, you know, the, the things that we've seen from people who know more about this sort of stuff than I do, the things that we've seen are, it's basically like, it's way too easy to defend Iowa's drop back passing game. Right. And so yeah. that, that doesn't have anything to do with quarterbacks learning their reads or the playbook or how, you know, complex or not complex it is. You know, I, I think it's just something that needs to be, you know, tossed out and rebuilt from scratch, which that that would be a painful experience. But gosh, you know, it's 2022 now, and I was still running a 20th century offense. Definitely. And yeah. They they got 10 wins out of it this year, but that was, I mean, against that schedule, <laughs> they they should have won at least nine. Yeah. <laughs> against those guys. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm curious just, how they how they address this. I really am. Yeah, so it definitely. I mean, 100. percent It has to be upgraded and modernized and all that. Definitely. I, I do think 
this season especially, I mean, they could not run the ball. And it's just such a fabric of this program and it feels like the state you know like like if they're not running the i mean kirk ferentz is an o-line guy like if that's not happening i just think they they go into every game thinking okay we have to be able to run the ball or i don't know what we're gonna do you know and and so that's why it goes back to petrus today where he had all this time and they were running and stuff and he was still missing the throws i mean they just need a guy that can make the throws and yeah yeah you know, I mean, if when Iowa runs the ball, it's very simplified and cliched, but when they can run the ball, they're normally going to win games. And mm-hmm. when they can't, they're normally going to lose. This year happens to be the outlier because the defense was, would they have 20 interceptions or something insane? You know, yeah. like just putting up video game numbers. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, that's the shame of this year with that schedule. If the offense is average, they have at least 11 wins and mm-hmm. maybe they were 12 and 0 in the regular season. You know, it's so it would have been close. Yeah, yeah. we're not close. Uh, so because that defense was just so damn good. Um, so yeah, no, it has to be modernized. You see some wrinkles, <laughs> like like I'm like, oh my god, they ran the Wildcat, you know, <laughs> like, which was yeah. instituted in like 2003. Yeah, so, <laughs> right, right. You know, the, so the, they're the, the cat in offense. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, so I but I think that's and that's part of it. Petrus's game is so predicated on not have you know having a running game. But he's still missing the throws, and that's inexcusable. Yeah. Uh, love this comment from Nefarious. Bob, Mark, and Mike coming back and forming the Stoops of Ultron. Oh, my gosh. Like, I are, are there any other Stoops siblings? Like, do, do they have a <laughs> sister? Because I bet that sister, you know, hits like a ice truck. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, but, well Bob's Carlo, son Carlo can transfer. Stoops. Yeah, transfer Drake Stoops. Over. Yeah. Like, yeah. Come, come home to Iowa, Drake. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying – it, it, it would be great. Uh, and and yes, I, I know that we're getting you excited about things that might never happen. But <laughs> but no, I, I mean, I really do think that Barda's list has a stoops on top of it. I, I honestly do. And um, and Joe also addressing the uh, elephant in the room. Good to see you as always, Joe. Uh, LeVar Woods. Um, boy, if he's not named as, associate head coach soon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think his days in Iowa City are numbered and, yeah. and not it, and and whenever you say days are numbered, it means they're not doing well. But gosh, that dude is way, way too capable to yeah. just be a special teams coach. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And his I, days are numbered for for good reasons for him, bad yes. for Iowa. Because yeah, he ex- should get, get out of there reasons. if he's not promoted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and it might be the case that he just, you know, loves coaching for Kirk, but yeah, uh I it would really, really surprise me if his title is still special teams coordinator. Uh, I'll, I, I'll, I'll be shocked if that's his title 24 months from now. Mm-hmm. I would be still pretty surprised 12 months from now, right? Yeah. And, I, and gosh, the writing's on the wall for it. And, you know, there's it, – it is a – you know, it's sort of a tricky situation to, to have to navigate – because if you do that while Brian Ferentz is, you know, still right there on the staff, like I, I get that Kirk might not want to do that, but but man, like if you don't want to give Woods a promotion that he has earned because of Brian's feelings, like get out of here, right? Yeah. Like that's not the way to run a program. It's just not. I, I'm, I'm sure it's not the way that Kirk wants to do things. Uh, Brian wouldn't be here if Kirk didn't want him to be the next coach. Yeah. But yeah, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you got to do what's best for the program. And that means like letting LeVar cash in just a little bit, just a crumb, just a crumb. You know, it's, it's, there's in such a weird, Iowa is in such a weird spot because Kirk's been there for 20 something years. Mm -hmm. And you see this around the nation, the Gary Patterson's, the Bill, uh, the guy at Kansas State, oh, God. Um, Snyder. Snyder, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Who tried, that's, I mean, that kind of aligns closely to Iowa in that he was holding out just to get his son the job, which the school just did not want to happen and eventually forced him out. And and it's like, it's a weird situation because as Kirk's gotten older, the recruiting's gotten better now and they're winning more than ever. Like, it's it's a weird spot. And so he has complete autonomy, as he should. I mean, when he's in, 
he's in position for 20 something years and winning and, mm-hmm. and they're winning 10 games. I, I understand that. And it's just a weird thing because now he has this legacy, but clearly his son, his operation right now is hurting any, you know, his legacy of getting that next big 10 title. And yeah. And now he has these, these nice, really nice assistants that should be promoted. It's, It'll be very – I mean, it would all be probably allevi- uh, alleviated if Brian moved on, on his own, didn't get ugly. He's welcome back if he has a good career, you know, all oh, yeah. of that. But, Absolutely, you know. yeah. yeah. This uh, this all feels like the dumbest season of succession. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where's Rory Culkin when you need him? Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, we are uh, we're about a half hour in, uh, so a little bit of a reset for everybody. My name is Adam Jacoby. I'm joined by Tom Close. We are both of GoIowaAwesome.com, and you are watching the Iowa Sports Review Post Game Flagship Edition, um, ringing in 2022 with a 20 to 17 loss to Kentucky in the Citrus Bowl, Iowa's first ever loss in the Citrus Bowl. Uh, they're yeah. now one and one. <laughs> Break, breaking a uh, breaking a uh, seventeen year one game winning streak. Tragic, but all good things have to come to an end. Uh, if you're watching on Twitter, there should be a YouTube link. Feel free to hop into that chat right there, and you can get your uh, beautiful, beautiful words right there on the screen, just like Joe's right now. Uh, you'll see the chat window. You'll see all the familiar names and faces in there. And gosh, any uh, hot takes, any thoughts, any questions, we'd love to have them because ultimately this is a show for all of you. We're just the beautiful talking heads for it. And uh, and while you're on our YouTube page, uh, we are contracted by law to say this. I will get thrown in jail if I don't ask this. But go ahead and click like. Go ahead and click subscribe if you have not already. Uh, it tells YouTube that you enjoy this channel. You can do a little white lie even if you don't enjoy this channel. But uh, it helps us grow the community, helps everything uh, get big and beautiful, helps get more comments going in the chat. Uh, it all it all feeds together. It's, it's all this thing. And uh, if you're really, really enjoying this, go ahead and uh, send this channel, this video, this whatever to a friend who also enjoys the Hawkeyes, Uh, sharing is caring. And in 2022, we're all about the caring, right? (laughs) That's our New Year's resolution, right? Right? We're doing this for you. It's the year of caring. That's right. Uh, And whereas 2021 was the year of Karen. And uh, (laughs) don't want to don't want to go back to that. Uh, All right. Uh, Let's see. Tim says fire everyone. (laughs) Okay. All right. We're, we're going to fire everyone. It would be interesting. <laughs> um, it, it would certainly be an unexpected uh, unexpected uh, little uh, change of events there. Um, yeah. Kirk Ferentz fired after losing in the Citrus Bowl by three points. <laughs> well, <laughs> at least it wasn't midseason, I suppose. Well, Kirk had a good run. Uh, bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> You know, I'm I'm, I'm looking at the box score here, and it's amazing. I mean, Iowa outgained Kentucky in the game, which is incredible, 384 to 354. And if you told me that, if you told me they'd run for 173 and Laporta would go for 122 and a score, Mm -hmm. uh, what, 31 to, you know, defense will force a couple turnovers, should be no problem. But they lose the turnover battle. They lose the time of possession, mostly that first half. Um, they had six sacks, Kentucky had none. Yeah. And yeah, it was just, it was, you know what it was? The margins that they always win in. They lost them today. And, and that has always, always been Kirk's, um, formula is to win in those margins. They, everybody on the staff says it. it's, they've been consistent with that message for years and years and years. It is, you know, win the turnover battle, take care of your, um, you know, take care of the defense, um, protect the ball on offense. And gosh, you know, I I can't remember the last time Iowa's won a game where their quarterback has thrown three interceptions because I also can't remember the last time Iowa's quarterback has thrown three interceptions. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Because that, that's not the way that they run their passing offense for better yeah. or worse. And, you know, 
uh, I, I think a lot of Iowa fans would say worse, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, because it them not throwing three interceptions also means that they're not taking those shots down the middle that can be really, really productive and yeah. um, and really ought to be productive more often than not. Uh, you know, for most teams, they are. But, um, you know, having such a turnover averse offense means it's just going to be um, a very conservative offense, right? There, there's, you know, you every now and then you might get one of those like unicorn quarterbacks who can throw for, you know, 4,000 yards in a season with only like five interceptions. Uh, I, I think the last one that we've had would probably be Drew Tate. Mm. probably um and even he made more mistakes than you know kirk would have liked especially as a sophomore uh but that's it you know maybe maybe labus is that guy um could be for all you well, know well, the new hype is the dude from new jersey that committed for like four years from now <laughs> yeah, right the, the, the 2023 kid yeah marco or yeah. something yeah. marco <laughs> um the the fact that he said that he was basing his game off of Brad Banks. Like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> fan, like, if if he's not starting as a freshman, the, the yeah. fan backlash is going to yeah. make this look like, you know, uh, that Coca-Cola commercial where everybody's holding hands across the world. <laughs> really, really timely reference there, Adam. Um, <laughs> Joe, Joe with an interesting yeah. um, question here. Oh, by the way, just to, to answer my own question um, from earlier, Stanzi, yeah, that that wacko Indiana game in, in the 30-mile-an-hour um, wind, I remember that one now. Um, gosh, when Iowa got the wind in the fourth quarter, it, <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I wonder, uh, and I'm also not going to look this up, but I would bet that whoever had the wind in that game, like, if you just, like, switched it, by quarter, I, I think the team with the win probably won like sixty nine to nothing. Nice, <laughs> you know, like yeah. <laughs> it was it was that big of a deal. Um, but yeah, like there's the answer to your question. That's how far back yeah. you have to go. Like Tyler Sash was still playing. Like, Jeez. yeah. So, uh, but but going back to uh, what Joe said here, we have more talent than ever. Fact, or, or, yep. or at the very least, the recruiting talent level. The star yes. level, if you will, um, is, is on an undeniable upward slope. And, you know, I think that we're seeing it play out on the field, too. You know, this is you, you don't get to say that Kirk only plays for seven wins anymore. That hasn't been the case for years. And, yeah. um, you know, this is the first time that Kirk's been string stringing together 10 win seasons since what? Oh, two to oh four. Right. Like this is yeah. this is sort of like once every 20 year territory for him. But it doesn't feel like that because the offense is so frustrating and so limited and so conservative that like it, it's weird to say that the talent is no longer the problem when Iowa outplays its recruiting so consistently, right? Yep. Um like you you would think at some point that a um developmental program that doesn't get a whole lot of four stars and five stars you would think at some point that you know that talent would come back to bite them and in plenty of years past it has i don't really think that that's the case anymore um no and, and the recruiting i mean it, it is it's insanely better in that i mean from less than 10 years ago to I remember 2012, 2013 when I was at Iowa and and uh, kind of a newer fan because I grew up a Michigan fan. And I was like, I remember recruiting with Michigan. It was always just like, okay, we're going to get like fours. And and at Iowa, I, I had learned to sort of forget about rankings because it was just mm -hmm. like, oh, he's like a two-star with a Western Michigan offer, but he'll be good. Don't worry. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Desmond King, like, yeah, no It turns offers. out to be Micah Hyde. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, Desmond King, two-star, no offers mm -hmm. from, like, anyone. He turned, he wins the Thor up, Thorpe, you know. And so that was sort of my, my whole thing with the recruiting. And now, like, you start to see, the, like, dudes. They're getting dudes yeah. and not just legacy dudes. You know, it was always the mm -hmm. Epinesas and, you know, the legacy guy. But now they're getting guys. And so the recruiting is as good as I've ever seen. You know, and I, I mean, just in the recruiting era, it's got to be as good as ever at mm -hmm. Iowa. And 
Yeah, I I mean that's a good point, but but the the funny thing is, all that being said, the one position that the entire sport is like based around is where it seems to be lacking. Yeah, uh, you know, yeah. and he was a good recruit. Yeah, they flipped him from Oregon State. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember late. Well, he was a four star. Yeah, very recall. nice yeah. recruit from I think California. Was he the one he broke Jared Goff's records or something? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, yeah. This, he was no slouch. Mm-hmm. Um, and and yeah. I I think. At the end of this, or at the end of 2020, I don't think people would have called him much of a bust either. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's been a real regression in terms of his career this season. And some of that has to do with the fact that he's not a good fit behind that offensive line. And again, yeah. is it his fault? Is it the offensive line's fault? Is it both? You know, is it the coaches? You're like, do we fire Brian Ferentz over that? I And I don't know the answer. Um, but I, I think ultimately Joe is right. You know, um, that whole game plan of win on the margins, um, hope 17 points gets you to the promised land. It makes a ton of sense when you've got developmental guys all over the place. Yeah. But I always got those dogs now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if you've got Keegan Johnson and Arlen Bruce and, uh, the, the Williams brothers, um, I, they're they're now brothers. I've retconned that into canon. Um, <laughs> like those are playmakers. Sam Laporta falling out. Um, and 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 uh, I I just want to say because we 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 spend so much time taking shots at Brian Ferentz that like if we're, if you're going to criticize the bad, you should acknowledge the good. And that Sam Laporta screenplay. Oof. Was sweet. Oh boy! There was some fire coming off my my TV screen. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> like I I know you can't make the entire offense out of that. Yeah, but that was sexy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> now I know, and the or the touchdown against Penn State, but actually worked today too. Mm-hmm. I mean, those are sexy play calls. Yeah. When, they, when everything goes well, yeah. Yeah. So he's he's good for a couple of games, but then he'll run the fullback back to back against Wisconsin. <laughs> Coming yeah. out of the bye week, you know. Joe, um, uh, you're right. Keegan Johnson didn't even have a target because he didn't play today. He yeah. uh, he woke up at three thirty, and they think it's either appendicitis or kidney stones, but like yeah. clearly, like unable to play. So, um, yeah. you know, if, you forgive if, him on that. that he didn't if, if he did have a target, I think that would have been Petrus's worst play of the day. <laughs> we'll, we'll put it that way. Um, yeah. And you know, Bruce. Bruce had plenty of targets. They got him, you know, they figured out a way to get him the ball. So I think there is a little bit of um, evolution in the right direction for Iowa's offense at the very least. Uh, But, you know, at the same time, they threw a lot at Nico Regani and Penn State touchdown aside. It just feels like, and I know it's not all his fault, but it just feels like bad things happen when you throw to Nico Regani. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and that's, you know, and that's part of the reason why, Bruce and Keegan Johnson vaulted up and Tyrone Tracy's gone and they vaulted mm-hmm. up the depth chart immediately because, and maybe this is part of the recruiting upswing. Now they're getting better receivers. Mm-hmm. Nico Regani just feels like a 2014 Iowa receiver, you know, like yeah. that's, that's what he feels like. And, mm-hmm. and that's no knock at him. I mean, look, he was wide open. If, if, if it hit him, he would have caught it. I think he's, he's, that, yeah. he's good enough for that. Um, you, you would think, <laughs> yeah, you would think. And and I is it, it, it I was just watching Kentucky's offense, and I gotta say this: Will Levis, tough dude. I mean, mm-hmm. not, I mean, just tough as nails. He should have probably, probably slid a couple more times. Would not fumble the ball. He should have fumbled about five times. I, I yeah, I, I was shocked that he never fumbled. Couldn't honestly. believe it. And that is what see. It's that that's the dynamic that running dynamic. And Will Levis is not a Patrick Mahomes. He's gonna kill you on his feet. He's not a CJ Stroud. He's not a you know, but he can run. He they can drop him back, and he can take off and burn you for ten yards. He can he can gut out a couple yards. They can do a keeper, the Sean Clifford play that was burning Iowa against against Penn State. And Petrus doesn't have that dynamic. You know, like there's just mm-hmm. a part, and maybe that's the evolution this offense is missing. Just someone who can run a little bit. I mean, yeah, even Nate Stanley, you know, was working a couple times because he was a big dude and would push a pile, but. It, there's no coincidence Iowa went 12-0 and and found ways to win games with C.J. Beathard being able to just run a little bit, use his feet. I mean, the plays at Iowa State, 
the touchdown, a couple of touchdowns against Indiana. You know, yeah. he could move. They could, you know, it, it the the big play to set up the field goal against Michigan the next year. So I, I think maybe it's as simple as that. I, the, mm-hmm. the, the thing with this Iowa offense is we talk about evolution, 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 but the quarterback position, the most important position in all of sports, is such a black hole at times that it's it just – once you upgrade that, I wonder if a lot of that takes care of itself. I, I think it does. And, yeah. and and to your point, like it they they don't have to have Michael Vick back there. Right. Uh they they don't even have to it, it doesn't even have to be a situation where you're, you know, calling read options half the time. You're, you're you don't have to like scheme runs for the quarterback for your quarterback's mobility to be a weapon. Yeah. Just yeah. Just the ability to get out of the pocket, keep your eyes downfield, and do something with the ball. Like our boy Marco is, he he looks like the first time <laughs> I was had a QB like that since Beathard. Yeah, um, and yeah. and even then, like he looks like a big old dude too. Yeah. <laughs> like, uh, he, yeah. Honestly, he reminds me of uh, like Dan Persa. And uh, you, you remember, I, I think all Iowa fans, I, all I'm do. sorry if I gave you all a uh, little flash of PTSD there, <laughs> but um, you talk about a dude who used his feet to keep passing plays alive. That was it. And and that's what we see out of uh, Lainez, I, I, Lainé, uh however. Lainé, you pronounce yeah, it. who knows? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll find out soon enough. But, but yeah, like that is that is totally a missing element from this offense because as it stands right now, all you got to do is pin your ears back and just like get in an Iowa QB's face. And unless he's running a bootleg and, you know, has that uh, safety valve right in front of him, which yeah. uh, Petrus did a couple times today. And I'll, I'll give him that. Like he got hit hard on some bootlegs and still got that pass out. But that is, that's the exception that proves the rule, right? Like, and in a drop back sense, if you get a guy in his face, forget it. It it is a it's a loser of a play for Iowa a hundred percent of the time. And like you said, that's not the case with Sean Clifford. Uh that yeah. wasn't the case with Levis. Um well, I mean it's any number, well, you know, so Wisconsin is like the Iowa whatever mm-hmm. Iowa esque. It's like the same thing pretty much with either yeah. better or worse quarterbacks sometimes. They dropped Russell Wilson in, and we didn't know Russell Wilson was an all-pro quarterback. But And it doesn't have to be Russell Wilson. But I'm just saying, like, you drop him in, and all of a sudden it's a complete revelation to the school. They march to a Big Ten title. They go to a Rose Bowl. You know, it's like it, just having that element because you can – Iowa and Wisconsin and the pro-style teams, it's all predicated on running the ball. And so if they can run – I mean, now you can, burn, you can beat them with the running game. The quarterback can run if you need him to when Beathard could. He, Beathard could make the throws, you, you know, and with Petrus, they, they couldn't run. He can't run. He can't make any throws. <laughs> so it's like you have no chance. Yeah. Um, quick little, we're, we're going to have to have a, a serious moment here, a moment of silence. Um, bad news to share with everybody. Uh, Spencer Lee, done for the season. ACL surgery. Uh, I was uh, 125 pound wrestler extraordinaire um, gone for the year. That stinks. Wow. Just got announced. It, it's on uh, Hawk Central. Like it's official. Um, bummer for the Iowa wrestling program. And I mean, honestly, for anybody who just enjoys collegiate wrestling, like wow. Spencer Lee was that dude. And uh, and we're really looking forward to having. A uh, big season out of him. I, I wanted him to win that natty this year. Um, mm. So that sucks. That's too bad. Spencer, heal up, and uh, hopefully we'll see you in uh, you know world wrestling, not not WWE like <laughs> like competitive competitive wrestling around the world. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like yeah. Olympic wrestling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully. Hopefully. So that stinks. Uh, that's too bad. Uh, just wanted to yes. make sure that we got that on the air. Uh, Cody brings up a good point and, and something that I think that we saw a ton of today is that like, and, and you even said it earlier in this broadcast, Tom, that it seems like Brian's good for about three or four of those like really sexy looking plays a game. But then like, as soon as we see one of those, it's back to, I don't, I don't want to say boring, 
but yeah. it, it's back to some really predictable bread and butter stuff. And, you know, I, I think that that is a mistake. I, I get that, you know, there's, there's a, a certain amount of comfort level that always gets baked into Iowa's offense, like comfort level for the coaches. And by coaches, I mean Kirk Ferentz. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, at some point, you got to realize that you can't let your own tendencies dictate how you call the game. Um, I mean, gosh, look at what Nick Saban did on the very first drive against Cincinnati. Uh, you know, he's got a Heisman winning quarterback weapons galore at receiver. So what does he do? He comes out of the gate and runs the ball 12 straight times yeah, and then throws the, the, the touchdown from the eight yard line. Um, Cincinnati wasn't ready for that. They, I'm sure, like, there's nothing in their scouting that said, oh, yeah, Saban's going to come out here and just run it straight down our throats. Yeah. Um, but that's what happens when you give him extra time to prepare. Whereas, you know, Iowa coming off of a bye week never looks like they've had the bye week to prepare. Um, so, yeah. so when we talk about, like, letting your tendencies dictate your offense, um, which is – you know, the real tail wagging the dog type of stuff. That's exactly what we're talking about. And, you know, yet Brian gets his, you know, bright and shiny toys, you know, his reverses and ends around and, and all of that good stuff. But it's that underpinning of, all right, now, now we're going to calm this down and go back to Iowa ball. Um, That really acts as sort of the limiter on this offense. And, um, I would suspect that even the people in the coaching rooms in Iowa city have got to, you know, be able to look at objective stuff like, all right, this was not a top 100 offense. Something has to be done. Like, yeah, we won 10 games without a top 100 offense. Imagine what we would have done if this was even like a, you know, 50 percentile, right? Like if they were in the top 70. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like, like we, we might be talking about Iowa in a almost certainly in a group of six bowl or a New Year's six bowl or whatever they want to call it. Um, well, you know, they, I mean, they, they would have been mind. Yeah, I mean, I just I'm sorry you, you hit a nerve. Wisconsin, the second half, the defense, I, I Wisconsin didn't really score. I mean, the Iowa offense was handing the ball instead of the five. The Michigan game, for as much as it got out of hand, fourteen mm-hmm. to three at the half. That second half, the defense or the second quarter. The defense was spectacular, and they just, you know, I can't blame them for that. So, yeah, definitely. They at least have another win and a New Year's Six game. That's no doubt. Yeah. I don't know if it's a Big Ten title, but they have another win. Yeah. Yeah. And um, all right, Ethan. Um, <laughs> this, is, this isn't just wish casting. <laughs> um, because I, in – if you'll pardon me for, for just a little bit, I'm going to try to find the, um, the Brian Ferentz article that was on Hawk central. So you know what this means? It's time for I Adam to sing his way through dead air. Scoop. I can fill it real quick. Go for it. (laughs) Now, just back to that USC thing real quick. The USC game was the typical, First of all, they, you know, it was almost like they lost. I remember they lost to Wisconsin by two. And then they came home and beat Minnesota, who was undefeated. And then they beat Nebraska. And that just reeked of like, oh, all of a sudden now we have all these toys and I'm going to empty the playbook. Because remember that, that Iowa team too, offensively had so much, fun. they had a lot of guys. I mean, they, you know, I, they were running reverses to Reganey. They had IKM returning kicks or not I, IKM, I, Amir returning kicks. He scored a, a, I think, what do you have, three or four touchdowns that game? I mean, they, they had Nate Stanley. That was, that was like, uh, compared now, it's like watching the, you know, the Peyton Manning Colts compared to what we have now. That in that mm-hmm. game. So I don't, I mean, he called a good game, but that that team should have won much more. His lot had been cast way before that USC game. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Um, all right, so I actually found the article, nice. um, and honestly, like. <laughs> I thought it was a juicier quote than it actually was, but I mean, it's, it's literally just Leistikow saying, uh, Brian Farron said he expects offseason changes ahead. 
how sweeping that might depend how Saturday unfolds, right? Like that's not, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> <laughs> this is the joys of uh, going live. Um, but you know, this is how Saturday unfolded and uh, not yeah. great. Not, you know, not yeah. terrible because the offensive line looked good and Iowa was able to run the ball. And so yeah. it, it might be like that worst of both worlds where, you know, obviously, you know, you, you want the offense to do better and, and maybe you make a change here or there. But, um, you know, ultimately, this is an offensive line conference. And uh, and so is the SEC for what it's worth. Yeah. Like you, you, you got to get it started in the trenches. Otherwise, like whatever, you know, like if, you're, if your line sucks, which Scott Frost still hasn't realized this, which is hilarious. No, I mean, he hasn't. If he hasn't. Line, no, you're right. If, if your yeah. line sucks your schematic choices matter a whole lot less than you want them to. Yeah. And I will look good running the ball for the first time all year. And, and it wasn't just because Tyler Goodson, you know, wasn't that guy um, in the backfield. Like I do think Gavin and LaShawn Williams, um, I thought they looked great. And they I did. also thought that they looked like they belonged in Iowa's offense. And there, there was a little bit of a knock and uh, Felicia Goodson noticed. She even said it on her uh, Twitter um, after the game, but a little bit of the knock on Tyler Goodson was, you know, he would try to run to a hole that wasn't there and then he wouldn't know what to do. And so you get some of those like choppy steps going into the hole and then boom, like loss of two. And you know, some of that was on the offensive line. Some of that was on the predictability of the offense, but you know, also some of it was Goodson. Isn't that like, I'm going to put my head down and get as many yards as possible. Definitely and, not. And, you know, more power to him because his his vision and his mentality probably translates really well to the NFL. I think he's oh, going to yeah. have a productive NFL career. I'm not I'm not calling him an all pro or anything like that, but um, he he reminds me of Fred Taylor style wise. Mm. Yeah, he screams like scat back. You know, you can throw to and that was. the Yeah. It drove me nuts. I, I was I was at the Maryland game, and he had that long touchdown catch on you know uh, out and whatever I don't know schematically what it's called right across the middle. They should have been doing so much more of that with the Gavin Williams experience up the middle between the tackle because T. Good he's not going to run over guys, and you're watching yeah. both the Williamses today running over guys. You know, mm -hmm. getting hit for, you know, gain of two and pushing it into six. And that yeah. just wasn't Goodson's game. Now, Goodson, I believe, still – did he still have 1,000 yards this year? Which is Yeah, he had 1,100. It, it was yeah, incredible. I mean, he still, it was yeah. still a testament to him. Spectacular yeah. talent. One of the best talents to ever come through the running back room at Iowa. I will Correct. firmly say that. They didn't Correct. know how to use it. I blame – that is 100% on the offensive coaching, I think, that he was not put in the best position to succeed in terms of – you know, the big time plays because mm -hmm. you're not, you could see it really when he started, this was not a between the tackles type of guy. And for some reason, I mentioned this in our Slack during the middle of the game, they knew what to do with Wadley more. And then somebody, I think our co uh, co-patriot Ross mentioned that was Greg Davis. It wasn't Brian Ferentz mm -hmm. and they knew how to use Wadley. I mean, they, the, the plays against that pen in that Penn state game, the long touchdowns, they would sweep them. Uh, he he caught a pass over the middle, ran for a touchdown, and there just wasn't enough of that with Goodson, and it's a shame. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a damn shame. Yeah, uh, and and even going back to when uh, Ken O'Keefe was the offensive coordinator, um, you know Iowa has always done best when its running backs are the one cut and go guys. Yeah, and Wadley wasn't that. Sean Green was that. Oh, <laughs> Cedric oh. Shaw was that. Yeah. Um, I think the I think the Williams boys are, um, you know, Sean was Lashawn oh, Williams. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, LeSean, absolutely. Yeah, Lashawn Daniels. Um, oh Daniels, Daniels. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Torn Young also the same way. Yeah. I I was surprised that Torn Young didn't have a, a more productive career, but like he he still made the most of his opportunities when he got him. Um, and and Goodson is not quite that, which which is not a knock on him because we are talking about an All Big Ten first team running back right like yeah like he he was he was a dude especially behind a good offensive line but uh behind a mediocre offensive line which is what this team was for most of the season yeah, yeah not a good fit 
Not a good yeah. fit. And, and that's I, just, and that's another indication of the antiquated offensive principles. We're going to rely on our tendency tendencies. We're not really going to evolve. We have this talent who doesn't fit our mold, but we're going to try and make him fit our mold. It, it's, it's, it's back to the coaching there. I think. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would agree. Yeah. Um, so hopefully they figure out some stuff in the off season. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, I know. Um, and, and also, like, honestly, because, you know, the, the coaches aren't going to come out and say this, but I'll say it. Hopefully the offseason includes the offensive line turning into some dudes themselves. Because, yeah. you know, we, we saw some uh, flashes of that today, and it was great. Connor Colby, where the hell was that? <laughs> I know. <laughs> he played the game of his life. Um, I know. So if we get that Connor Colby next year with making no other changes, yeah. the offense is going to look better next year. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now yeah. what do you do without Linderbaum? Because I guarantee he's gone. I, I can't believe I haven't gotten a note about that yet. I That's, yeah, that's amazing that he, I like, was, like, I, I, was I'm not, I guess not stunned he played, but if he opted out, I would have been surprised now. I, no one would have been surprised, but yeah. you know, I it, it also sort of feels like like he's that kind of guy that yeah, he's going to see this season out. Which hey, yeah. more power to him. Like that is yeah. that's some real captain stuff. Yep. Um, so, but he's got to go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, definitely. I would. It would he be has, great to see him back, but it would be a shame to see him back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, yeah. honestly, he has nothing left to prove. Now he he's nothing. the best center in, in football. Yeah. Yeah, and and he's probably going to be the highest drafted center in about. 30 years yeah uh which is nuts um yeah. but but he will have earned it and and i think that he's on his way to a great nfl career too like a Definitely. really really great career um all right we are an hour in and our viewership is still going strong so here is a little bit of a reset for everybody my name is adam jacoby i am joined by tom close we are both of go awesome.com and you're watching the iowa sports review 2022 post game flagship edition uh unfortunately iowa lost 20 to 17 in the citrus bowl to kentucky perhaps you've heard and uh hmm. we are taking your th comments your thoughts your hot takes uh we might not agree with all of them but we will certainly entertain them so if you're watching on twitter go ahead and click on that youtube link join us in the chat and uh you'll, you'll see that in the bottom uh, that corner Probably it depends on it, it. It'll be down somewhere. Uh, <laughs> depends on whatever format you're using. If it's mobile, tablet, desktop, whatever. Uh, but go ahead and join us in the chat um, because we are enjoying uh, everybody's thoughts. Um, honestly, this has been a a a much more interesting chat and a uh, a much less insufferable chat than i was expecting i'll i'll be completely transparent about that i was telling our producer before this like i'm not looking forward to all this backup <laughs> like i i really thought it was going to be nothing but people asking where padilla was uh and and chat's been great uh so yeah, the most out of the box was the best comment. Fire everyone, <laughs> <laughs> right? Which, which was funny, um, yeah, it was hilarious. Uh, and, and I'm sure it was said in jest. But chat, pat yourselves on the back. You know, let, let's let's get some uh, thumbs up in the chat. If you can do thumbs up in YouTube chat, and you might not be able to do that. Never mind. <laughs> uh, good talk, Adam. Um, <laughs> Ethan, Ethan, that's that's not. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm interested. I gotta say, I'm intrigued <laughs> by by how ugly they can get it. Or yeah, how ugly they, they can get this thing. Oh yeah. Okay. Well, um, <laughs> it can't be uglier than the offense. Well, so. all right then. Then we'll throw Brian Ferentz in jail, like <laughs> <laughs> for crimes against football. Yeah. That, that's no. Right. I, you know, Ethan had a, a, a good comment right before that. What one thing did they need to change offensively? Uh, can I? I don't know. Quarterback? <laughs> it's too easy. <laughs> it is. It is. Oh man. Well, I I think this I think this season. Uh, the big takeaway from this season has been it's not just one thing about the offense. Um, you know, let's get the offensive line better. Okay, great, but 
you know, the play calling is still not putting them in position to succeed very often. Yeah. All right, well, let's change the play calling. Well, okay, but, you know, that offensive line isn't going to, you know, traditionally, or, you know, over, over most of the season, uh, not including today, but over the most of the season, you know, if your quarterback's getting, you know, free guys running at him uh, and, and you can't execute an inside zone on second and 10, like mm-hmm. you can call whatever you want. That's great. You can, you can have fun with Scott Frost on that train. Um, so, so many things yeah. that need to be just updated, right? Um, I, I don't think there's any team that's not in the top 100 out of the 130. Like, none of those, like, bottom 30 offenses in D1 ball have only one thing wrong with their offense. Yeah. So, um, you know. Yeah, what, no, because we've seen Iowa offenses that can't throw, but they can run. Mm-hmm. They sure as hell can run. And they've been better than this offense. Um. Yeah, I, I, one thing to change. Uh, okay, then let's take let's take Petrus just out of it because that's the obvious one. I mean, I solidifying that offensive line. I, you know, I mean, just making sure when Linderbaum leaves that they and that might mean hitting the portal to shore up that O line if they're not sold on it. But like you know, outside of is can Wandell hit the portal again and then come to <laughs> Iowa, you know like I, I would like a receiver like that you know yeah, like, yeah, yeah. so yeah I, I don't know I, and I think I think schematically scheme that would help more than me just switching out one position I mean I think that that takes care of a lot of things yeah um you know actually like we we, we just spent several minutes explaining why it can't and shouldn't happen. But one thing that Iowa could really change offensively this season that would, or this off season that would really help bring back Linderbot. <laughs> like, <laughs> if, if, if I'm allowed to play God here, then yeah. like, let, let's get him a, uh, a, a $5 million NIL deal to keep yeah. playing in Iowa city. Right. Like, let's do that. Um, <laughs> but like, that's, that's about what it would take. Like, yeah. And, and unless Falbo Brothers has five million in the bank for Linderbaum, like he's he's done, he's gone. Um, <laughs> now those old wrestlers would get Lloyd's of London insurance policies that would oh, pay off yeah, if people yeah. up their knee. Yeah, definitely mm-hmm. one of those. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> um, so okay, Joe, uh, uh, I, I got a little bit of inside baseball here for this comment. Um, Joe says it might not be such a good sign that Chad isn't going nuts. A hint of apathy. Um, I'll say this, our viewer count, which people on the chat don't get to see our viewer count's been great today. And whenever there's real apathy, it means that people like we see it in the views. We see people not showing up. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people wanted to come and talk about the, uh, about the game. So, uh, I, I would not read apathy into our little, like, tiny slice of the youtube internet i i i and and i realize that i'm saying that out with with more information than what you've got so yeah. uh this is not an argument uh <laughs> this is not a you're wrong but um no like viewers have been good even even after an hour so uh so don't worry about that uh i i think people are still invested in iowa football even though uh, it's the most disappointing 10 win season ever, which is, you know, sort of like saying you're the worst dribbler in the NBA. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, you know, there was a time where I promised myself at Iowa, if they win 10 games, it, I'm not allowed to be disappointed. Um, <laughs> this is testing it. It really is. Uh, yeah. Because well, it does feel like a lot was left on the table. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah. I, I think that I think it's okay to be frustrated more than disappointed. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll put it that way because yeah. it, it is a little bit frustrating yeah. to know that this team was so close to really, really like special season type of stuff. And, and that some of it was a little bit like self-inflicted, um, which you never yeah. want to see out of a football team. But at, you know, at the same time, this is college football and yeah. this is a team that uh, historically doesn't, you know, recruit inside the top 25 very often. Um, so it doesn't win 10 games often. 
No, not often. Uh, yeah. I mean, recently, sure. Recently, yeah. But, but, but by and large, again, like at, as I mentioned earlier, I think this is the first time they've had three straight 10. Well, no, I guess last season wasn't a 10 win season, right? Like, but, right. but I think that, uh, let's see, prior to that. So it'd be nine, right? Nine and four. Yeah. So, so yeah. they went nine and four and 18, 10 and three in 19, 2020 doesn't exist, but they finished that on a six game winning streak yep. and like 10 wins here. Like, that is sustained success that they have not had in almost 20 years. They they deserve some real plaudits for that. And I think we also need to understand that this is not a given. Yeah. This, like five years from now, it is not only possible, but plausible that we're going to go back to thinking, or that we're going to think like, Hey, remember when we were winning 10 games a season? Wasn't yes. that awesome? And like, and the answer shouldn't be no. Uh, yeah. You know, like, yeah. Uh, no, and that's what's scaring me a little bit with the fan base in that. And, and the beauty of this, I guess, is that we could never run Kirk out. You know, like there could really never be. Oh, so it's the beauty and the curse, maybe, that there mm -hmm. couldn't be a lot of changes. But. Curse fans. It's scaring. It's scaring me a little bit, only because it's it's not like this is you know this isn't like Michigan where like with the talent you should always have like nine wins and then a couple of you know like you should be being Ohio State like this is Iowa and we have to understand that now I will say this we might get to the point after another year or two of this where okay now we're here you know now this isn't new anymore and now that next step needs to happen and I think that's fair. But, I mean, this year, and, and it's tough, and the apathy thing comes back into play because the lows were so low. You know, and that's that's the other thing, too, that really kills you in seasons like this, is it's like today was almost like a refreshingly exciting loss. I mean, the Purdue game was a disaster. The Wisconsin game was an abomination. The Michigan game was laughable. Like, you know, like today they gave up a late lead, but it was – I can live with this, you know? Yes. and yeah. I think that's it's the weird thing about this 10 win year. By the way, this 10 win year when they won almost all their rivalry games again, except Wisconsin, but won the West outright. Outright. Yeah. They didn't share right it. Out. It wasn't yeah. a week eight and four West. They went 10 and two and won the West outright. And that should not be taken for granted ever at Iowa, ever. Until right. until this program starts winning, you know, multiple Big Ten titles, am I going to start expecting them just to win the West every single year and, and win 10 games? It's not realistic. And you're right. Five years from now, my, uh, Mark Stoops might be here winning eight games a year. <laughs> you know, like, you yeah. never know. Yeah. Uh, Ethan has a good question here. And, um, you know, does Iowa ever win 10 games under Kirk Ferentz again? Because, like, boy, this the mm. schedule this season, we didn't know it at the beginning of the year, but the schedule yeah. this season was cake. And that is, I mean, Ohio State is on the, on the slate next yeah. season. And I, I now and Michigan and Michigan. And now, now people, people might forget that the last time Ohio state played Iowa, Iowa won 55 to 24 in never 2017. Forget. People forget that. <laughs> should never um, forget that. So Iowa does have a winning streak going, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I think next year is tough. And, and, yeah. you know, after that, we, we really don't know. We don't know. So, um, so that is why, when these 10 win seasons happen, enjoy it, embrace yeah. it, talk that smack to every Iowa State fan you know. Oh, now, oh, now, God. yeah, now they they have the most togetherest team, so <laughs> they got that on us, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, they they were within a score in the Cheez It Bowl, so there's <laughs> that. Um, for their, their greatest team of all time in the Cheez It Bowl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With their greatest quarterback of all time, who yeah. I, I'm sure must have beaten Iowa at least once. At least, no, at least twice. Once. Had to, had to at had least to twice. <laughs> I mean, Sage no. Rosenfels beat him. <laughs> uh, Steel Jance. I, that was a good Steel game to be Jance. God. No, so are they ever going to win 10 games again? Yeah, I, I'm just going to throw out yes, because I think they're better than most of the programs in the West. Next year, I don't know. They got to go to the shoe. They play Michigan at home. That's tough. But I think the the encouraging thing with the Ferentz experience that we're in right now is recruiting's at an all-time high. 
Thank you you know, like they, I mean, if you looked at, and I'm not for the, at Iowa, you can't be all about stars or anything like that. And I, you can't put all your eggs in this basket, but I mean, you've just a look at the recruiting rankings this year, far and away better than any other team in the division, at least this year, you know, yeah. so I, they're, they're good. They have the talent and, you know, if they can figure it out a little bit on offense, this team will be winning nine, 10 games, you know, most years, I think with the yeah. talent they're bringing in, it seems yeah. like year in and year out. So I, I, I think it, this isn't like this was just an easy schedule and that this and that, you know, I still say winning at ISU was a bitch. It's a very nice win. You know, it's never easy to oh, win yeah. there. Yeah. That ISU team underachieved. I thought I'm not telling you they were great, but I thought they underachieved a little bit, you know, and then the rest, it is what it is. Um, yeah. Yeah. The um, I'll say this about recruiting and, and I get that. On a macro level, stars are important. On an Iowa level, they're not as important. And yeah. so, you know, just because Iowa's star level is going up is not necessarily indicative. Um, Definitely. Of, yeah. of, of all that. That being said, um, it feels like Iowa is getting the guys they want. Like they're they're landing the guys who have had scholarship offers for months, right? The ones that got them early, and and whenever Kirk, and especially whenever Phil Parker gets the dudes he wants, oh boy, like he knows how to use them. Oh we yeah, got, X is coming to town, man. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, like, put yeah. Him, put them wherever you want in the secondary <laughs> in 2022. Name name whatever position you want. One, he can play there. Two, he's probably going to be great at it. Yeah. Um, and that is going to make a scary defense even scarier. And and oh my goodness, what what this defense brings back next season? Yeah. Oh boy, they're going to be mean. Um, yeah. See, so you can't just. I mean, Michigan at Kinnick in October. Can I just go? Yeah, Michigan's going to roll in there. I mean, you know, it's you got to. I'm not the game. so sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and especially if it's under the lights. Let's yeah. ask Michigan about that. Yeah. Um. So yeah, like the the schedule is tougher, but yeah. um, the amount of teams in the Big Ten that Iowa just does not have a realistic shot at beating is either zero or one, depending uh, well, on what you, yeah. depending on what you think about Ohio State. Yeah. Um. So these are opportunities for Iowa to win, and yeah. now on the flip side of that, in especially in the Big Ten West there are vanishingly few easy wins. Yes. And so those, you know, even Olympic hurdlers trip over those things sometimes, right? And and so there's a lot of hurdles in the West. Now, granted, Iowa just got, you know, over them, you know, over enough of them to win the West without an offense. Um, <laughs> and I, I'm holding out hope that the offense is going to be a little bit better next season. Just like – it has to be right, it, yeah. Doesn't it? Ah, oh, if the oh. okay, if the offense is the second half of today's game, do is that like throughout next year? If that's what you see next year, is that significantly better? Yeah, honestly, yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah, that's, yeah. And I, yeah. I mean, if 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 we get an offense that can that can score like two touchdowns per half, yeah, next season, that's an upgrade. Yeah, that's not great. Um, so we'll see. Oh boy, oh boy. Well, Tom, we've kept you for darn near an hour and a half. Uh, we're we're bumping up against eighty minutes. Time flies. And, and honestly, like I got a Rose Bowl to watch. Um, but <laughs> uh, so I, I I think this is as good of a time as any to wrap this up. But uh, chat, give yourself a uh, a round of applause. Uh, you know. The, especially after a really disappointing loss. Yeah. Um, I think we had a, I think we had a good show. I think we had a productive show. I think we had some good conversation. I was really happy with that. Uh, and uh, so thank you all uh, for joining us. Thank you all for participating. Uh, once again, if you haven't clicked that like button, just go ahead and do so. You know, it, uh, it tells YouTube that we did a good job and it should uh, put us in front of more people's, faces uh we always like that and uh share this with uh whatever iowa fan you know that you know 
enjoys the sound off, but uh, doesn't want to call into a radio show in the year of our Lord 2021. Like this is, this is the new, like hotter version of it. And, uh, <laughs> and with that, happy 2022, everybody. Let's yes. make this year awesome. Uh, let's, let's uh, get our downfield passing game going. Uh, both from an Iowa football level and from a personal level, like <laughs> whatever that means, <laughs> throw it deep, y'all. It's, it's we're we're throwing it deep in 2022. Yes. All right? happy, before we go, Happy Shoot New Year. Um, next week, Tuesday, we'll I'll be on. Wednesday, you'll be on. Correct. Mm-hmm. That's and, right. Uh, big basketball game on the third. Is that Monday? Yeah, Monday, Maryland. So uh, I'm looking forward to that one. Lots to uh, talk about. Yeah. Coaching, uh, it'll be Fran McCaffrey against Danny Manning. Danny Manning. Yeah. Danny and the Miracles. That's right. Yeah. So with that, <laughs> thank you all for joining us. Have a lovely rest of your uh, January 1. Um, stay warm. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Go Iowa Awesome. Go Hawks. Go Hawks. Good night. Bye. <laughs>